to the last session today. My name is Harald Makamul. I'm working for Bosch in Germany. And I want to give you an impression what we are doing in the Amaltea project. The project is a publicly funded European project under the ITR2 program. As you can see, we want to provide uh, an open source and um, also um, publicly available environment for embedded multi-core systems. So the partners are from Finland, Germany, and Turkey. We have some um, universities and institutes, uh, some tool suppliers like ETAS or Timing Architects in Germany, and also some suppliers in the automotive industry like Bosch and Bea Heller Thermo Control, PHTC. The Finnish partners are more related to telecommunication and the Turkish partners are from um, a service provider and a car manufacturer. It's a subsidiary of Fiat called Tofas. So we started two years ago and the project will end in April next year. So we already have something to show what we did till now. A little bit of motivation. So we see a really great increasing of functionality in embedded systems, especially in cars. So we have a need for additional comput uh, computational power. And with the growing complexity of these systems, we also need uh, standards, a better possibility to reuse systems, and a good tool support for that. And um, to get more performance, the traditional way was to increase uh, the clock frequency or caches or things like this. But as in the traditional computing or desktop uh, computing, there is a limit uh, reached. And so we also have to move to multi-core systems. And especially uh, embedded multi-core systems have some special challenges we want to address. So if you see this as a very high level view on software with some executable elements and the errors are um, dependencies or execution order in, to be precise, you will have several paths through the software and you have to find uh, possible parts of the software that can run in parallel. In addition, you have hardware that is more complex and not so, um, a, not so simple as before. So you have different cores, different capabilities of the cores, also different memory with different access between cores and memory. So you have to address different targets and you should be able to deliver your software to the different targets and to optimize it for the different targets. So the first question is how to distribute executable units to cores. But there is another aspect. Uh, all these elements have representations in memory. So the operations of the program, but also the data, is located somewhere in, data, uh, in memory. And you have to find a good mapping to the existing memory elements in your hardware so that there is no conflict or as few conflicts as possible and fast access, of course. So for simple systems, this can be done manually, but I will give you the numbers of a typical automotive system. And um, I think it's obvious that tool support and tool optimization is required here. So to the project goals, I already mentioned multi-core, so the efficient multi-core development is one target. The other is we want to be compatible with automotive standards, and we also want to deal with variants or product lines. This is uh, handled by some partners and will not be the focus of this talk. And uh, in the end, we want to um, not only produce um, 
reports, but real usable software, or at least prototypes, that will be open source under the Eclipse public license. So first part will be the topic multicore. What do we want to do? What, are, what do we already, what have we already done? Then we have some um, parts related to implementation in the Eclipse environment. And the last part is uh, open source steps, what we want to do and um, activities in future. So all our tools and all our optimization will work on data models. So we have two main models here. The system model that will represent what you have seen before, system structure, hardware structure, and also the constraints for the mapping. Then in the middle, there is a, a possibility to execute this or to simulate this on a higher level. And we will get some event traces at the end, and we have to do some analysis. So we want to see if the runtime behavior is like we expect this. For example, are there some deadline misses? How is the response time? Things like this. Uh, the approach here with two different models allows us to use different tools, but to have a common tooling for pre-processing and analysis. So this allows us to have, for example, different simulation tools, but also uh, real hardware and measurement units to get some information about runtime and things like this. So in general, we have the possibility to use the results of one execution, have a feedback to the model, can improve the model, or the uh, accuracy of the, the simulation, and we can also compare the results of different tools that are, have specific um, usages. So now I will concentrate on the left side, the system model. So as I already said, there is a software description. I will show here something in more detail. Um, the hardware description, and uh, we also will represent the result of this semi-automatic or automatic mapping in the data model. So that what you see on the right side here, the software mapping, is also part of the model. And the constraints you see here in between will guide this mapping and software distribution. So you can give some timing constraints. How is the overall runtime, reaction time? Um, are there any mapping constraints? This is mostly related to security issues, uh, safety issues, um, because sometimes it's necessary to compute things in parallel. And um, typically, these hardware ECUs allow that some processors run in a so-called lockstep mode, so they compute things in parallel and the result will be, will be compared. So this is a restriction for placement, and there are some other things like uh, specific capabilities, of course, that have a better performance, better I.O. support, and things like this. So in general, we want to have a model that describes the system on a specific level that gives us the possibility to exchange data between different companies, different suppliers and OEMs, for example. And we also have the possibility to do custom tooling. So if some company has a specific way to deal with software parts, it can be implemented because it's an open model. A little bit more in detail, the software part. So we have different possibilities and especially different levels of abstraction to describe the software behavior. The simplest way is to, uh, to only provide the time consumption. So this is enough to have some timing simulation or scheduling simulation, but you can go into more detail if you provide additional communication behavior like access to data or yeah, dependencies between the different tasks or runnables, as it's mostly called. 
So the most detailed way to describe is, is to describe call sequences. And as you see on this image, there is also the possibility to have different paths through the system. And here on the left side, you see that uh, with some probability, 20% of the cases will be used here. 70% will execute here and 10% will execute this path. So you can use this in simulation. You can give some statistical um, deviations, how the runtime is distributed. And so you have a lot of possibilities to describe your behavior. Now we have seen the models itself and I want to show now where the models are used in the development process. So the common way is to have some source code, a compiler, and it will create the executable. In most cases, in embedded development, there is also a modeling of the behavior, so a domain-specific description and code generation, and then the compilation. And we want to have an additional path here. So we not only want to create the code, but also we want to create the software description. And uh, this is, for example, done by um, commercial tools like ETAS. One of our partners have tried to do this. And we have uh, tested the Damos, Eclipse Damos tool also to provide us with some information like this. So with additional hardware, and the constraints description, we can now do the multi-core optimization on that level, and we can reuse the data we get here to do additional generation of glue code or generation of operating system configurations and things like this. And altogether, we get an executable system that has a specific static distribution to cores. That's the typical case in, in embedded hard real-time systems, at least. Now, the, the other model. We also want to have a, a common way to deal with the trace data. And um, what you typ typically get from a simulation or execution is a long list of timestamps with some context information on which core it was executed, which task, and what happened at that specific point in time. And what we do is we trace this information and store it in a, in a database that allows us to, fast, uh, to have a fast access to specific data we want to, to use in our analysis. And to give you an impression what we want to see in that analysis what timing is relevant here. I printed, this is a, at least in the automotive industry, a very common state machine for tasks. So if a task is executed, it will start in this suspended state. It will be activated, then it's ready for execution. It will be started, then it's running. If there is a higher priority task, it can also be preempted, so it will be stopped. Another thing will be executed and will, it will continue after that. So it will be here and at the end it will terminate and be in the suspended state. So this is the typical situation. And if you look at this in this timeline here, you see there is an activation. There will be some time in ready state. Then there will be the running part and it will, a terminate, will be a termination. Within one task, uh, in at least AutoSAR um, language, it's called runnable. It's a kind of function call within the task, a sequence of calls here. And during that execution, we can have some parts where higher priority things are executed. So there will be ready time in between. There can also be some waiting time, so waiting on an event and something else can be executed on this core. And after release, it can be start, uh, continue. First, it will be in the ready state, then it will be running again. So that was the case in single core systems, and that was pretty, pretty OK. So it was the main information that was required. But in multi-core systems, there is an additional state 
an active weighting. So it's possible to have a situation where you weight on a value in the active state during running, and if the value is available, you will continue with your computation. And obviously, also active weighting or polling shouldn't be longer than needed. So we extended this uh, 06 state machine, this is a standard, and created a more complicated and more detailed one, but it has the same elements. So this is like the terminated or suspended before, waiting, running on top and ready here. But there is a finer distinction between the different states here. So essential for us, it's compatible with OSEC states. It's, uh, it includes the states we wanted to have, and it allows things like um, task migration or multi-core analysis. And we also released this as a so-called best trace format. That's not our term as version 2.1. It was formerly uh, uh, already used by Incron and several other companies. So um, I showed this because I think it's essential to have the same interpretation of the data. So what we tried to, to implement and what we implemented are the green parts here and also the green elements here. So we have a possibility to create traces from real hardware. There is a demo board and we create this compressed format, but it has the same logical content as, we, as I described before. There is a so-called open timing information exchange format from, from Gleva. So we also use this and we can transform our traces to this and we can import the traces to our trace database. So that allows us to use real hardware, also tracing tools like Cleaver, and as a third uh, possibility, the simulation tools from Timing Architects will also produce that trace file. So these traces can be uh, um, visualized and analyzed by commercial tools like Timing Architects, but it's always possible to have common analysis because this um, database schema is open and it's easy to read and easy to, and to do the analysis. So we found that uh, we have no tool that did exactly what we wanted to have in the analysis. So if you want to have comparable results, it's, it's necessary to do this custom analysis. So the last part here is what we have done next to the data models. So data models was the main topic, but we also wanted to show that it's uh, sufficient what we have in the data models and that uh, it can be used for some prototypical implementations of elements that are required in the development. So as I already said, on top there is the modeling component that will provide software descriptions. Um, I omitted here the hardware and constraints. They are also in the data model. And then partitioning is the separation of software into parallel executable parts. Then mapping or simulation optimization, we can generate some code, execute the code, and we have the feedback if we use it in the trace model here. To give you an expression, I have one example of a simulation tool. So this is a typical visualization of the execution. And um, you have here the core zero to, to keep it simple or simpler as in reality. It's only uh, related to core one activities, what you see here. The second core is here and the third is, is even below. So you see some priority, the higher the priority, the more on top is that task. And for example, if this task is running at the end, the, the, all these here, that I have to say, are ready if they are in the gray section. So the most uh, top level element will be started, then the next one will be executed, and the, the 
low priority tasks that will only be executed once a second will only be activated if no other activity is on the system, for example. So you can do some analysis, how long will the tasks run, how is the utilization of the different cores, um, how much overhead is related to communication and things like this. So implementation was done based on Eclipse, I already said. So we decided to take the automotive distribution as a basis. You can see, read this as a, a kind of stack. So we have the automotive distribution. We have Sphinx included in the automotive distribution. And so the requirements management framework, um, RTOP for Autosar data, ARTOP for East ADL, and also Amaltea will use the same workspace management. And I hope this is a, a good possibility to address the other data models and to handle the other data models. We also have the possibility, and we implemented this as an example, to use OSLC to connect external uh, data to, uh, or external tools, uh, especially um, requirements management tools in our case. So we, want, we tried to reuse as much as possible from existing bro, uh, projects in Eclipse. So the blue ones are Eclipse projects, so, or Eclipse-related projects. Yakindo is, a, is not an Eclipse project. Uh, requirements model will be linked to our model, also the component model. And um, we decided to model parts of Autosar and East ADL again in our data model because we wanted to keep it simple and, and small. And we defined some mapping to produce Autosar files or to read Autosar files. So it's only a very small part of that big specification that is used in our data model. And on the left side, we have the data sources. As I already said, the Eclipse Damos tool was one example. Uh, Yakindu state charts was another example. Both have code generation and can also produce software descriptions. The model is, itself is a modular, so we have different sub parts. Uh, each part is modeled with X-Core, so we use standard uh, technologies in the Eclipse environment. So the Eclipse modeling framework, X-Core for the definition, and Sphinx for the workspace management and the editors. And um, as one example, um, this is um, these are several screenshots of model parts that are in these typical Sphinx editors. So description of operating system, some stimuli, hardware, and so on. I have two other screenshots or two other examples, but only to show you that there are some other activities. I don't want to go into detail here. So this is a possibility to handle software and hardware variants in parallel and to describe uh, constraints for example, if I want to run a specific software component, it's required to have this hardware element as a supported element or as an input. Another one is the um, component model of Yakindu that allows us to uh, use that component model, also the Franca interface definition language uh, with different uh, behavior models. Last point, um, openness. So we decided very early to uh, provide an open platform. We see the, uh, the advantages that uh, we have several partners that uh, want to also use the model and we are able to share the effort for maintenance and um, further development of that platform. We want to have a, a standard, or at least de facto standard, for um, system description so that we can exchange that description with others. We have already some pilot projects between Bosch and uh, Volkswagen, for example, and we exchanged some obfuscated data. So it's even possible to, to keep the IP and to 
only give away some timing information, for example. Okay, and last but not least, um, we want to use different tools and we want to be as independent as possible from specific tool vendors so it's easier to exchange tools if you have a common format here. We tried to do um, most to be Eclipse ready, so we ch have chosen the Eclipse public license for our distribution. Most of our project uh, partners are also Eclipse members and some are also in the Eclipse Automotive Industry Working Group. So I think it's a good basis to be in that Eclipse environment. And so we also published our first preview on Eclipse Labs. And it's in the Eclipse Labs part of the automotive working group. So there is the automotive distribution, ARTOP, and also Amaltea for download here. And on the right side, you see um, the welcome screen and also the help. So it's mostly two or three examples uh, of existing models you can create with a wizard. Uh, the description of the hardware model and some simple tools, so it's the beginning. We concentrated on modeling here, and this is um, the first possibility to handle these models here. As I said, we um, announced the preview in September. We did this, and uh, the idea is to release the final release in April based on service release two of Kepler then. That will be also the, offic the official automotive distribution then. To our next activities, um, the program uh, or project will end in April and we supplied for an, a new project. We found some new partners that are also interested in the results we did till now. And so we proposed a so-called project outline. This is the formal way to uh, apply for a new project. So the project outline was uh, rated as the top um, outline they got, and so we have the invitation to submit the full project proposal. That will happen tomorrow. So we are on the way to create a new project. If it is accepted, it will start earliest in summer next year. And what do we want to do? We want to collect results of our project, but also results of other publicly funded projects or other projects, and bring them together to a real application. And um, of course, we want to build a user and developer community. So one of our major goals is to create or propose an Eclipse project in that next phase. So, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? We will definitely use it in the current state. Uh, we got the permission to, to put it open source. That was the first step. We do not have an agreement to uh, be committer for a longer term. So this has to be decided in yeah, the next year, I think. And there are other part partners that are more used to contribute to, to open source projects, but uh, there is no decision till now. Okay, thank you.